what makes for effective teams. And part of what I want to do, as I said in the beginning, is to give you some tools to help you deal with this knowing-doing gap, with the fact that you're so busy, you're overwhelmed, you've got a lot of things to do. So what we need is we need tools to actually make this simple. The first step in that is realizing that we don't have to focus on everything. We actually have a small set of things that make the difference between the really, really great teams and the really, really terrible ones. The next thing we need to do is find some way to organize all of that stuff that we put up there in a way that makes it easy for us to execute and recognize what's going on. For that, I'm going to be using uh, what we call the Team Effectiveness Pyramid. This is a tool that we've developed. I developed it in uh, collaboration with Martin Haas of Wharton. And Martin and I spent a lot of time thinking about and working on teams. Martin also is a researcher who spent a lot of her career studying teams and the way in which people collaborate. And we worked together to figure out, well, how can we create a tool that allows us to actually deal with this in practice in a way that is simple, that is efficient, and that is effective. So we, uh, we published this in uh, Harvard Business Review in 2016. Uh, as a, with an article, The Secrets of Great Teamwork, and we provide the background and the basis for where this research comes from and what that actually means. Now, I have to be honest, we are not the beginning of this research. We are not the, the originators of this. This builds very, very heavily on the work of Richard Hackman. Richard Hackman was one of the preeminent, most well-known, well-respected scholars of teams and groups um, in the last 50 years or so. He unfortunately passed away recently. But Richard is someone that both Martine and I had the opportunity to work with, and Richard studied teams in a wide range of organizational contexts and other contexts for over 40 years. Corporate teams, top management teams, civil and uh, military flight crews, symphony orchestras, uh, intelligence agencies, you name it, he has studied it. Not only that, Richard was also the source of a number of doctoral students who have led successful careers studying lots of elements, again building on his research. So much of the intellectual heritage of where this comes from, it originates with Richard's work, but we've built on it and we've adapted it, particularly with an eye towards the digital age. So our goal here is to understand what makes teams as effective as possible. Now, if we're gonna talk about team effectiveness, we actually first have to have a quick discussion about what do we actually mean by a team being effective? Now, if I go into an organization and I ask anybody, if I ask any of you, think about a team you're on and prove to me that that team is effective. What are you gonna show me? It's very clear. There's one thing that immediately will pop into your head, which is, well, what do we look at the output? We look at what the team is there to produce. Every team is there in order to do something, and that means there's somebody who's looking to see what did they do. Did they produce enough of the thing? Was the thing that they produced uh, good enough quality? Uh, were they efficient in the way in which they produced it? Right? If you use, if you burn through all the resources you have for an entire year in two weeks in the beginning of a project, it's going to be hard, even if you get all of your milestones, even if you hit everything, to argue that that was a success, right? Because your efficiency was very, very low. So everything that I would put in the category of output, output includes everything like efficiency, it includes output quantity, it includes output quality. All of these things fit in that bucket. Now, we use the team effectiveness pyramid, right? And when you look at a pyramid in only two dimensions, you've got three angles and three sides that we really care about. So the astute among you will recognize I'm looking for more stuff. Output can't be the only thing that matters. Output isn't the only thing. There's a second piece that we have to think about that is equally important to output, and that is collaborative ability. That is the ability of those people in that team to work together and to work together in the future. Now let me be very clear about something. This does not just mean are people happy. This is not saying we should all just get along. If everybody's happy and everybody hugs and feels good, isn't that wonderful? I don't care about wonderful. Remember, I was a computer scientist. That's irrelevant. I want output. But here's where collaborative ability matters, particularly for output. One of the things that we see happening a lot in today's organizations is that people don't work in only one team. They work in many different teams. And they don't work in one team for a long, long time. They move in and out of these different teams. 
When that happens, we have a new problem. If you work together, say five people work together in a team, and they get amazing, amazing output. They hit all of their milestones. Everybody is so happy about what they produced. But at the end of that project, they hate each other with the power of a thousand suns. Every time they walk past each other in the hallway, they say, you, I'm watching you. I'm never working with you again. You've actually reduced organizational capability because the organization can't put you together anymore. You've created non-recombinable parts. It's like thinking about a jigsaw puzzle and cutting the corners of the pieces. They don't fit together anymore. So not only do we care about what we produce in terms of output, we also care about the ability of those people to work together. Not because we want them just to be happy and get along, but because that is actually a fundamental core building block of our organizations. This brings us to the third piece of our pyramid, which is individual development. And this is very straightforward. You care about your people getting better. I guarantee that every one of you out there at some point has heard somebody senior in your organization say, people are our most valuable resource. Does that sound familiar to any of you? If it does, I'm not surprised because this is said widely. The important thing is if you aren't developing your people, if your people aren't getting better, they're falling behind. And if your people are falling behind, so is your organization. So when you think about team effectiveness, I want you to think not just about output, I want you to think about all three. About the output the team produces, its ability to collaborate together in the future, and the development of the individual members of that team. So we left off talking about the key elements of effectiveness within teams. And we said, look, there are really three pieces that we need to think about. One, obviously, is the output. Did you actually make what you were supposed to make? And in the right quantity, in the right quality, in the right efficiency, as you expected. Second is, are you actually collaborating well? Did you work well together? And are you happy about that? Do you feel excited to work again with those same set of people? And the third is, do people actually develop? Did they get better? Are, is your team gaining skills? So the question is, how do we get here? This is the top of the pyramid. We want to know how do we reach that top of that pyramid. Now, one of the problems is, one of the challenges we face is everybody knows dynamics are important, right? All of these sorts of things on the left-hand side, these good dynamics, we know we want these, right? We want people uh, to have trust and fun and good, fair process, and we want to make sure that their decision-making is good and high quality. At the same time, we also know we want to try to avoid the stuff on the right, right? We want to avoid people trying to seek status for themselves, uh, pressure to conform, power struggles, holding back information, bad negative conflict. And lots and lots of people who are trying to get you thinking about teams, they say, you know what you need to do? Fix these. Less of the ones on the right, more of the ones on the left. Less of the ones that are negative, more of the ones that are positive. So what you need to do as a leader, what you need to do as a team member, is sit there with your eyes wide open, looking out, and as soon as you see one of the red ones, you pounce on it. Make it go away. As soon as you see the green ones, you say, oh, more, more, more. That's not the way that I want you to think about effectiveness and how to get there. So while we all know that having the right dynamics is important, this is not where we actually want to spend our time and focus our effort. Instead, what I want you thinking about is the fact that collaborations, what makes for successful collaborations, is having the right conditions in place to get these good dynamics. The way I want you to think about it, actually, I can use the analogy of an airplane, about a pilot landing a plane. Now think of the last time you were in an airplane. Sometimes you have a good landing, a nice landing, one where you're in the middle of a conversation with somebody and all of a sudden the next thing you realize, oh, we're here. Those are the good landings. At the same time, we've also all had that landing where while you're coming in, suddenly the plane goes very fast to one side. And you all look around a little bit nervously. It goes very fast to the other side. What happens? Well, we suddenly become very friendly with our neighbors. We suddenly renew faith in all sorts of different things. We try all of them just in case, right? Because we get very nervous. We don't like those kinds of landings, the ones where you bounce back and forth and do all this stuff. If you ask a pilot 
What makes for that first kind of landing, the good, smooth landing? And what makes for the bad landing? What they'll often say is that bad landing comes from a pilot overlanding the plane. The way you want to think about it, when you ask a pilot what makes for a good landing, they will often use the phrase, the start of a good landing is a good approach. The idea that they use is, if you're at the right distance from the runway, the right altitude, the right speed, the right pitch and yaw, if, and I'm not suggesting this, but if the pilot just let go, the plane would naturally want to land itself. That's the way I want you to think about effectively managing and working in your teams. The goal here is not to fix the stuff that's going on. That takes a lot of your time and a lot of your effort. And as I said, you're busy and you're overcommitted. What you want to do is you want to get the right conditions in place, the enabling conditions that will lead you in the right direction. These condi conditions, when they're in place in a team, enable the right kind of dynamics and a successful team outcome. And the really nice thing, when you look at it, we're going to talk about these different steps that enable us along the way. These account for up to 75% of the variance in team performance. This is work done by Ruth Wagaman, and Ruth looked at a lot of the conditions that Richard Hackman, as I said, had set up, right, these core enabling fundamental conditions. What she found was that the teams that were successful versus the teams that weren't, the biggest driver was getting this set up right. It wasn't about the leader. It wasn't about somebody stepping in and fixing stuff. That's the mindset that I want you to have. And what we're going to do now is we're going to start walking through these levels of the pyramid that get us to our effective team.